Hey, what's up? You're tuned into The Cutting Room, the show where we talk to industry-leading marketing professionals about their content marketing philosophy, process, and pregame before they edit an article live. I'm your host, Tommy Walker, and thank you so much for joining us live today. In fact, I would love it while we're uh, while we're kind of getting started here, if you can just leave us uh, a little bit about who you are in the chat and uh, just let us know that you're here and let's take advantage of the live format. Uh, so, you know, we're here live. Why not? All right. So my guest today is Ronnie Higgins. I'm very excited to have this conversation. He's a longtime fan of the show, but also somebody whose work I tremendously respect. Uh, right now, he is the director of content at Open Phone. Uh, before that, he was at Hoppin. Uh, he was at Eventbrite and Udemy. And he has several credits within the film and television industry, which I think is something that's very, very interesting to me, especially because a lot of the conversation I know we're going to have today, or at least I imagine we're going to have today, is going to be centered around building a B2B media brand. It's something that I have heard over and over and over again throughout my career. And generally speaking, that kind of falls apart, mostly because a lot of businesses don't know what goes into building a media brand. Uh, but fortunately, I've got that experience. Ronnie's got that experience. And it's something that I am incredibly excited to be talking about today. So again, if you have any questions or would like to make any comments, please, please, please use the live chat and uh, we'll, we'll get everything started. All right, so without any further ado, Ronnie, welcome to the show. Hey, Tommy. So good How's to be going, here, man? man. Thank you for I'm having so me. I'm so excited. This is gonna I'm, be great. I know, man, like <laughs> I said, like I've, been a fan of the show since its inception uh i remember the first time you uh was it tracy was the first yeah yeah, yeah. tracy was the first yeah episode. and i was like we need this so badly like and i'm just congrats on you know, the full year and i'm just looking yeah. forward to this conversation me too. And it's actually the first one, uh, first one that we're having in 2023. So I couldn't think of a better person to have on and uh, I couldn't think of a better topic for us to be talking about. So, you know, the format, we're going to jump straight into our first question, which is tell me a little bit about your content marketing philosophy and how has it evolved over time? I was so I'm than I look or that most people imagine I'm in my mid 40s and was part of like the earth and the early internet it, I think you and I share the memes of like mm -hmm. I am the tide doesn't matter fire and all the other old old memes and there was just this internet back then that you you could express you could be like there was just like a way to get every there and put it out there and connect with a community of people um and it was around that time like that i finally just go to college and get a film degree and it was during that time that i would say my philosophy marketing started to kind of coalesce even though content marketing was for like another 10 or so years uh, yeah. maybe a little bit less than that and um, I had really amazing teachers that helped me understand what I was seeing on the internet they helped me understand mm -hmm. uh, mass communication media literacy uh, one of my teachers uh, name was David Jones was an Imagineer at Disney and mm -hmm. he was just like I wanted to absorb everything from him. And I remember him showing me this old 1957s, like how Disney saw its empire and how it repurposed uh, and atomized all of that. its content. It's amazing. And so like how like the movies fed the content of the, the theme park and all of these things. And then as uh, before graduating, took classes in film and media theory so while most like you said uh my background's unique in the world of content marketing because so many people from like a journalism or literary background so while everyone else was 
uh, journalism standards and understanding literary theory. I was learning film theory and media theory and broadcasting strategies. And to fast forward to, I had a film career, like you said, I have IMDb credits, uh, tip of a hat for actually knowing that. Uh, not many people know. And it's, I get into content marketing because uh, it's around 2008 and the economy tanked and I found like an entry level job. And I said, hey, I, can I make a video about this new program you're doing just to scratch that itch? And I made the video in like a week or so. And can you keep doing that? And around that time, like, yeah. So they hired me to be a video marketer. And I, <laughs> I, I mean, I loved, I loved that I was creating things, but I felt alone. And I, yeah. I also disliked that uh, the performance and the success of my, the, my work was limited by the, I didn't have control over the messaging. And I understood from my background in film that, you know, the marketing of the content, of the movies of the tv shows played just as important role as the creative of the actual content mm -hmm. and so i started looking into that and stumbled upon um a book called get content get customers and who's that by marketing uh i am literally on his name and it's killing me right now he's like one of the godfathers of content marketing uh Pletzi, joe Pletzi. Okay. Uh, he says not to buy that book, by the way, outdated these days. Uh, so just to show you like how old uh, that book is and when I got started in content marketing. And it opened my eyes to decide everything that I knew and understood about media was going to be going in-house in companies instead of needing hire and, you know, a fancy ad agency with like tv production and all this and needing to get commercials and content on like in movies and in tv shows could do it themselves which brought me back to that idea of the early internet like anybody can do this and it was around the, everyone was uh talking you would see this headline over and over again just as much as you word chat gpt today uh you would see <laughs> king and I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, why is everyone saying the same thing? Where, what is the origin? Who was the first person to say it? I've recently found out it's who I thought was the first person to say it. it wasn't the literal first person to say it, but the person who I would say popularized the phrase was uh, Bill Gates in a mm -hmm. 1996 essay. So 1996, back to like that early internet days where uh, the first opening sentence of this essay or blog post actually uh, is uh, most of the, I expect most of the real money on the internet to be made. It, sorry. Content is where I expect most of the real money to be made on the internet, much like broadcasting. And mm -hmm. when you read through this essay and for me, that background, I said, I really understood that like what I wanted to do, my career and my professional life had a path and I remember like getting that first content marketing title mom about it and she was like you sure like that's like <laughs> is it because I kept telling her it was like this new thing and she's like you sure you know anything that's like guaranteed and I was like I just feel it and yeah you fast forward to today and I feel like still in me that idea that it's not about just like searching for keywords and just slapping together a bunch of paragraphs about it and if you think back like in days of content you couldn't just like look at top ranking content because most of the top ranking content was at least five years old at the time yeah and this was the first mover uh advantage as they call it uh, i was able to publish something on a tuesday and see it rank on wednesday morning uh but my philosophy about content continued about putting on a show putting on an experience putting myself in the the audience's shoes and understanding how does this add value what is this experience like for them I make sure that what I am crafting is the best thing that they could spend their time with, 
because I know that content influences people, media influences people in ways that if you harness that, you can like help a business grow. And that's mm -hmm. why I've lucky to work with really amazing people and work with really amazing companies like the ones that you said. And so if anything has changed or evolved about my philosophy, it's been that how to do it and how to approach it is continues to evolve. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started, it was just about gathering and doing the research. It was that journalistic approach of doing the interviews. And, but now it's just, I mean, there's so many things that have changed. And I think the way I approach it has changed because knowing how much more competition there is and mm -hmm. knowing that I'm not just competing against another, like in B2B SaaS, I'm not competing against direct competitors, but I like, if I'm communicating to business people, I'm, com I'm competing with like Harvard Business Review, I'm competing with business and, and in the last few years, I'm now going against TikTokers and YouTubers and like everything's changed internet. Um, I, I use this term decentralization of the web, not in terms of web three, but the idea that it, when we first started in you and I, uh, there were people who were show like only on like a handful of websites, Facebook, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. yeah, like Google. Now everybody's spread everywhere and algorithms are, have stifled your reach. And so you just need to think a little bit more strategically about it and you can't just worry about the content. Yeah. When, when I first got started, it was actually, we got started right around the same time. And when I first got started coming from an acting background, I was like, oh, uh, script analysis is market analysis, right? You can read between the lines of what people are saying on Twitter. Uh, customer service is nothing more than improv. Um, character study is building a brand, right? And there's this, like, almost if you're, if you're taking the time, this one-to-one -one sort of relationship about what it is to build a performance, if you will, uh, and then create media that does keep people engaged. And like one of my personal philosophies when I first started, and I still believe this to a degree, is this screen that you and I are talking on right now, people don't view it very differently than movie screens or TV screens of the past. And our main competitors right now, I would say even for my own attention, right, is more uh, YouTube videos that are more entertaining. I want to spend more time being entertained than I do uh, wanting to learn, if you will, uh, about the things I should be doing and all those things that people are telling me. Um, and, what's, and what's interesting about this, people, one of the things that I, I had promised spicy takes in this session uh, yes. on LinkedIn is one of the things that most content marketers are failing at tremendously is thinking entertainment, education, and all these things being separate things and mm. not respecting their audience enough to understand that they can extrapolate and extract knowledge and insight. Um, they ignore the fact that they'll watch food network and feel inspired to do, you know, they'll watch like uh, top chef or all these other like shows um, and not realize like they're actually learning at the same time. You yeah, probably even learn a lot of stuff from movies that you don't realize. And so it, when you respect your audience and you start to feel like there's like more you can do with everything and it's all just like a, a lever that you kind of like or it's more like a sliding thing that you can have a little bit more entertainment, a little less education, things like that. Now, what would what would you say is the thing that a lot of people are missing in that part of the conversation because I know the conversations I've had around that. And it's like, let's do, you know, let's do a podcast or let's start a YouTube channel. And then it's, there's this like creative development process that media brands go through mm -hmm. that I think a lot of businesses don't go through yeah. or think about it, right? go beyond just like, Hey, here's, here's, 
here's the format that we want to do, right? Or yeah. here's the channel we want to be on. Can you exactly. talk about that just a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, you're making me realize like, that has tremendously changed in the, the, the decentralized, like the of web. I hate now saying that because of its association with web three, and that's not what I mean, but um your strategy needs to with first who is your audience or your ideal uh customer profiles and but from there this idea of your audience's cartography it's not just like what keywords and top your uh competitor web uh websites rank for but where your audience where does your audience gather what are the topics and uh, keywords and things that they talk about. What are the format media that they like to consume? And then you need to then, once you had that figured out, you can start to understand how to leave a breadcrumb trail from what you're talking about to mm -hmm. getting your product of the con or service to be or brand to be part of the conversation. And it starts with that audience research. Uh, think of Spark Torah. So you've Mm -hmm. uh rand on the show uh, i think you even had a man uh, mm -hmm. and so um what they've been able to do is a manual process that i've been doing for at least a decade of i would go and i would find i would figure out who my icp is i would then go to social media and i would then try to figure out what groups and sort of like pages do they follow i would follow mm -hmm. that breadcrumb See, okay, where are people discussing this? I would find Facebook groups. I'd find Reddit, um, subreddits. And I would then analyze those things to us. People talking about how, what's the conversation? How are people talking about this topic? Because mm -hmm. I've, throughout my entire career, have had to target an audience that is already an expert. I can't just lean on the what is right stuff. And so... I would need to figure out like, all right, do I help this, like the brand feel like it's part of the conversation and has an authoritative voice. And so I've had words from there, but now like you have tools like Spark Toro that make it a little easier. I mean, I don't want to say it's like people, you know, what people think he is of like write a blog post and you get like the most eloquent thing. It takes some work still. You got to know your audience to get the real value out of it. But it starts there. It starts with understanding and what they're doing and thinking about how does this content play a role in their everyday life, um, which is like the next step. Because uh, I don't know the most recent um, stat, but the last uh, average American at least spends 10 to 12 hours a day consuming meat. Mm -hmm. if, <laughs> if you Just think wild. spend a large percentage of that learning about your product or service, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. Uh, and so that's to understand is like, all right, what are they consuming? What is what they're consuming and what they're, it's, this is back to movies and TV shows is genre conventions, like yep. taking that idea of genre conventions and say, okay, and this is the way TV is produced or created uh they a media company understands that it needs to sell ads it has a target like audience at a certain time watching a certain show and it but a, you know they, they start from there of like all right we need to set it's easier to think back to the old days of like soap operas and why their name soap yeah. operas because they were created to help so sell soap to housewives who were home and this idea was like, all right, we need to see wives at our home doing household chores, 1950s. And how do, if you want to go back to the radio, even in the 20s, and basically like, how do we, you know, what do they want to capture their attention and earn their attention and hold it long enough that we can sell them something? A dramatic show about ships. And that's how they yep. came up with the content. And you, when you think about what you want to say, and it, this is back to uh, Marshall uh, McGollin's 
uh, the medium is the message. This is another thing mm -hmm. that I think most content need to understand. You can't just do a podcast. You can't just do without respecting the medium. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna jump in here yeah, for a second do because it. something that came to mind as you're talking about the conventions is there are structures, right? There are common structures with the different media that we consume on a regular basis, and something that a lot of people you take for granted or you don't see it. So when I was in school, we talked about, we did a lot of script analysis, right? We had a whole course on script analysis and we had to break down, I can't even tell you how many scripts. And what you find in a movie anyways, is that everything that your, your inciting incident sets is set up right around the first 15 minutes, right? The 15 minute mark, generally speaking, that's where your inciting incident kicks off. That's where the story starts to kick off right around the half hour mark. Now you've got this sort of trough of disillusionment. And this structure is something that's ingrained into our media consumption habits. And we don't realize it, but it's it's something that we 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 don't see, and it's something that or we we don't recognize. But when it's brought out into the media that's being created, right? Or you create something that's familiar. That's the familiarity, right? Yeah. And give you an idea too, like one of the things that I do personally, and I've seen you, uh, this sounds very similar. Uh, a lot of our process actually sounds pretty similar. Um, when I'm anal an analyzing, analyzing um, what type of content we should be creating, I'll set up a uh, Twitter uh, filter where it says, who is sharing my competitor's content? Now, I'm going to follow those people in a list and I'm going to see all of the other things that the, those people are sharing. And that gives me an idea of how to package my message in a way that is something that will be delivered. Right. Um, you talked about genre tropes, right. Mm -hmm. Or genre conventions. And that's something that we see a lot of. There was a, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I did, I did, wrote a blog post a long time ago and it showed all the different action posters, right? For a yeah. bunch of different uh, movies. And it was like, they all had this similar explosion, red and yellow color scheme, you know? And, and from a distance, they all looked very similar. And it's something that I think we need to consider a lot more. I want to ask you, right? Tell me a little bit more about your process when it comes to planning the content that's gonna be created, using this information that you've gathered from your research, Tell yeah. me the next step. So it all starts with the business. Uh, what is the business objective? And what is it that we're trying to do? And what is it that, how do we need to position ourselves in the market to achieve goal? Uh, yeah. Because it about content as like a bunch of pieces of content. It's actually like, probably another gripe of mine is there most content marketing today is random acts of content. They are mm -hmm. focusing on single pieces, trying to rank instead of thinking, taking a step back and thinking, what does my content holistically like as one big thing say about me? Yeah. Uh, let me actually in this way, if we're going to talk about media companies is if I say a go, you think of a certain type of content. When I say A24, you think of a certain mm -hmm. movie. When I say CBS sitcom, you know, like this back to like taking genre conventions to a different level. Uh, when I know what the business is trying to achieve, I can understand after that audience research what we need to say and how to approach the content in a way guides people through like their product awareness uh, mm -hmm. which is why I something I use instead of the funnel so I'll talk about the funnel between mark and salespeople to just as a shortcut but the funnel there are people who are either unaware of you or a problem and unaware of any solutions and then someone goes from unaware problem aware product aware to most aware and I of the content mix as that mm -hmm. and not like before I think of the medium or anything and so I want to make sure that I have the full 
of content that's going to take them from that unaware, help them understand something. So uh, to use an example with say, you know, our product is all about helping businesses become more productive uh, communicators with their communicate more productively with their customers. And I would want to produce a guide that helps them do that, whether they use our product or not. Just yep. here's what we stand for believe is productive effective customer communication guide that an aware piece i then help them become through problem aware they realize like oh people's expectations have drastically changed in what business how businesses interact with customers and then i explain to help them understand that problem and understand that their solutions first their team they need to work on their skills. So then there's a piece mm -hmm. about that, about how to do that. And throughout all of this, I am leaving small little breadcrumb trails. This is this product-led content that I realized when it, the word got um, a few years ago that I've been doing it since the beginning, is you actually just mention your product every now and then. And the way you mention it, uh, changes as you get closer and closer to your product aware and most of and so your product aware, most aware stages are what you then like your job, the content's job is to then explain and help convince them it's the best solution out of all solutions. And so that's a lot of content. And imagine like yep. your content person of one or just have a small, how do you produce that much content? Enter content. So uh, you've heard of the Pareto principle, 20% of the produces 80% of the results. That same idea applies to your content production. And mm -hmm. so what I will do is I will identify uh, the piece of content that need to be produced in order to generate the other 80% of the content. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the early days of content marketing, this was like content pillar approach or mm -hmm. the uh, carving up the turkey. I think it was what Jason Miller from previously LinkedIn uh, and uh, used to call it. And it was this idea that you took an ebook, which was about 3,000 something words, and then you took each chapter and carved it up and turned it into a, blog, a standalone blog post. Uh, and then you take that and you email, landing page, all these things. My approach to it is a lot different these days. I think of uh, instead of it just being ebooks turning into things or big form pieces of content turning into short form, but what are the sources? Can I do a mm -hmm. a series like this? Like if I were to have this show, season would have like a guide that gets updated into the like philosophies and things like that, and updating it every year. Um, I would start thinking about how to um, do like that show to customer quotes so if you do like a cab or a event where you have subject matter experts like wax and poetic about whatever that topic is you think mm -hmm. about that maybe a month before you're gonna publish like the guide or it's vice versa and so i think of it as like that back to that 1957 diagram which i wish i had on me right now but just google disney 1957 diagram and you'll see exactly what i'm talking about and you start to see how like it all is like big machine. And so mm -hmm. then all of the like, uh, when you think of your team's capacity, you focus on that percent. And then the rest of it just, I think you would be better at this than me because I need to learn a lot more about automation, but figuring out ways to automate that other 80%. But yeah. even without the power of comp computer automation, the rest of it ends up being so much more awesome. like especially today with gpt if like you manually even have to jasper or chat gpt or whatever your tool of choice is you can then just say like get blog or 50 social uh post write a thread things like that um yeah. based on that content but that's like how i approach the like actually making the content uh, mm -hmm. From there, it's about empowering the rest of the company and teams and subject matter experts to producing or public promoting the content. So uh, making sure that as you're producing the content, you're thinking about the distribution strategy. 
uh, you interview people who have a network and when you say you pay someone like 1k to be your subject matter expert don't just pay them to publish their secrets make sure in their contract is you will commit to within like a month posting x amount of things do that yep. with your partnerships whether it's like you know you're doing a co-branded piece like making sure that you're thinking about that too so that there's a lot of promotion behind it so thinking about that ahead of time too not thinking of it as oh now i need to distribute and promote no like think about that before you produce the thing that way you can like uh make sure everything is like automatic for you I'm going to try and tie some of this together. So it sounds like when you go into your planning process, it's, it's this idea of what if somebody reads my thing or consumes all of my stuff from front to back, right? What is this? Yeah. yeah. So like, what's the overall message that I'm trying to put out there? And what's the full narrative? Because you're able to then foreshadow what's going to be happening next. You can reference back what's going to be happening, uh, what happened before, and uh, get people hooked. One of my personal philosophies is that you can never get into the consideration set if you don't have people returning, right? 100%. So it's, it sounds like that's one of the things that you're looking at in there. And we actually, so in the chat here, Ashley says uh, she didn't know that about soap operas. And uh if you were born in the 80s or 90s and you watched a lot of 80s and 90s cartoons, your mind's going to be blown that most of the media that we consumed back then was actually reversed engineered from toys, right? Toy companies wanted to sell toys, so they would order pilots and limited run series to see if uh, the toys would sell based on the stories that were being told and then uh, take it from there. And if the, the show didn't do well and the toys didn't sell, then they'd scrap it. And that's uh, another idea of product led content, but back, you know, 20, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago, God, I don't, there's <laughs> nothing new under the sun. Study that no. stuff and yeah. you will, that's why like, there's people who on like Twitter will talk about how like they don't read business books. And I'm, I mm -hmm. understand there's a lot of business books out there just like people like tooting their own horn or like listening to themselves and it's hard to extract knowledge out of some stuff, you know, some yeah. like, friends and influence people should be like 50 pages long <laughs> yet. It's not. Uh, right. I think studying even the like media content marketing, like studying why things were and not accepting them as fact will teach you so many valuable lessons like that. Uh, and thinking about how it's, merchandise and swag plays yep. a role in your content strategy uh because for me that's another thing too is like i don't it's almost like i don't want to follow the rules or have ever thought there's like a defined playbook yeah like a spotify playlist is a piece of content yep <laughs> and i think of you know things like you can use Spotify as a distribution. You can build an audience on Spotify. You can build an audience in a marketplace like Airtable with a bunch of templates. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like more ways to go about content marketing than just SEO and blogging. Like to free your mind from, and I sound like a hippie, but hey, I live in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> like when you free your mind from the like, rigid constructs of what content marketing is and you study like the history of media and you learn all the mm -hmm. film and media theory like so many ideas will come to you and that's why i'm about like next decade of content marketing because now that everyone's blogging and now they're everyone's now trying to dip their toes into new mediums like we haven't seen anything yet yeah I um I highly recommend anybody who's watching the stream to to also check out the documentary Art and Copy. Uh, I can't remember. Yes. Yeah, I can't yes. remember the person who came up with it, but there's uh, he's written a book. I'm gonna find it. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but the philosophy was an ad man back in the the 70s yeah. 80s, and he said the whole thing that they were trying to do with their ads, realizing that people are channel surfing 
right? They wanted to get grab your attention as soon as you were channel surfing. And that is more relevant than ever now with yeah. all the different feeds and, you know, TikToks and the TikTok yeah. clones. Like, you're really just trying to scroll and grab somebody's attention immediately. Um, we're a little over time on where we're supposed to be going, but really briefly here, you've got everything taken care of. You're, you're ready to prep. You've got content that's uh, in the queue here. Tell me a little bit about your pregame before you edit, and then we'll jump straight into the live edit. So I grab wine or whiskey. No, I'm joking. Uh, sometimes <laughs> I have to. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it depends on the content. Now, there are times where if I've... If I'm just starting with a writer or a first piece, I I want to make sure I have zero distraction. I mean, I always want to have zero distraction, but um, I have I, I one of my idols is uh, Rick Rubin, and he's kind of all over the place right now with uh, 60, uh, 60 minutes and his philosophy on like being able to bring out the best in someone and so i approach all thing like that i want to find a way to be kind yet brutal in my feedback because uh, uh one of the early guests that you had margaret jones was uh literally has taught me everything about content mark uh she taught me when she was at marketo and i was devouring her ebooks and then she was managing editor and boss at Eventbrite. And she has like kind of instilled in me this idea of like it, this experience and taking the time to make sure that the, t the it delivers on what its promises made from it, like is setting up the next sentence. And so I need to set aside that time. And so mm -hmm. like at open phone right now, I am like the de facto managing editor to like block off like hours of deep think time to on all of my editing and i basically will read the piece so like the piece that i, I read it um i skimmed it first so i read the like heading i read the intro i then skim the h2s and i'll go back and i'll do the deep actual read and then i'll put it aside if i can sometimes i have to go directly into editing I don't like it. I like to put like a little bit of like brief pause mm -hmm. in there to give my, my, let it swim around in my head a little bit more. Uh, but from there, I then start to go in and like chop. And mm -hmm. for me, I have a very rigid process too of, I don't like seeing things like, oh, here's the draft. I like seeing things at the, uh, in fact, Animals has a really good article on this of the 10, 30, I forget what it's 70%. And I like seeing things at that 30% where I have like the intro bulleted out, I have mm -hmm. H2s, and then I have like at least one line of what's going to each paragraph's like thesis is going to be. Um, because this back to Margaret Jones, she taught me because I considered myself a pantser before working for her, the skip outlines because i like the like art of just like being messy yeah. but she's like yeah it takes a fuckload of time for me to edit that and it would be if we actually like figured out the developmental edit issues in the outline stage so right so i like to see that outline so i can then say it would actually be better if you did it this way right and then you can go and write and my editing feed the a little bit easier to manage uh, because if you give me a draft and I realize there's a lot of like developmental issues. <laughs> and Margaret, uh, she's edited me sort of quietly before with a piece I tried to guest post. She is violent. She is a violent editor and uh, I love it. Um, all right, so why don't you pull up the piece? And while you're doing that, I just want to give a quick plug to uh, one of our new sponsors. I'm actually an affiliate of this company, and I'm uh, very neurotic about who I uh, encourage people to look at. So there is a company called Content Harmony. Uh, highly recommend them. They are about writing briefs. 
And that's their major bread and butter. And they have a number of great features that allow you to uh, click buttons and automatically populate briefs. And uh, if you want to see a little bit more about that afterwards, let me know in the comments and I can show you because it is a game changing tool that makes it, it brings a lot of tools together in one and it saved me maybe three to four hours for each brief that I create. So something that's definitely worth checking out. Uh, viewers of the show also get two months free if they decide to subscribe uh, and you can get your first 10 credits for 10 bucks or for free if you do a live demo with them. So anyways, let me know in the comments if you want to take a look at that after the show and I will give you a brief walkthrough. Uh, now I'm going to mute my camera here and we'll take a look at the piece. Now, before we get into it, tell me what were your first impressions of this piece was oh boy <laughs> so i want to make sure that if the person uh who sent this piece over that this is coming from a place of caring that you have a goal for this piece and you have an intention for this piece to do something and so anything i say is that uh is meant to help you get to there and so Without further ado, I'm just going to say that I was just disappointed. Uh, it felt like it was crafted for robots, uh, aka like algorithms, Google search. Um, and I think if it, based on some research, I accidentally stumbled upon the article live and found out like I have an assumption that it's just not doing what it needs to do. Um, and I will be giving feedback that hopefully will turn it into something even better uh, if they so choose. Um, so my mic was muted for a second there. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Uh, I've also dropped a link in the chat here if anybody wants to check it out as we're going along. Sweet. So the first thing I did is, so when I was given this piece, it started from here. Uh, but with all of my content, I want to see, this is my brief. It's been refined over the years and based on a lot of experience working with other people and refining it. And I'm sure months or years from now, it'll be even uh, changed from there. But this is one of the most critical things that will not just help you create the best content, but help someone like me, the editor, evaluate it. <laughs> um, when you're asking someone for feedback, whether it's the editor or even like the person who's the subject matter and re uh, reviewing the content, you want to basically tell them how to provide feedback and help them understand the type of feedback that you're looking for. And so this brief talks about your audience ICP. Who is the intended audience? What's the role? This is not a section to go deep into like the psychographic of that person. That's what the rest of this is. And, but just to understand who is the audience from their product awareness level. Uh, this is essentially, I talked about earlier, like, do they already know they have a problem? Do they, are they aware of solutions? And do they know about your solution? Um, and here you would choose one of them, unaware, problem aware, solution aware, product aware or most aware. And that helps me understand how many, how you position the, uh, the product or services that you're pitching uh, to know if your uh, the tone is right or it's the right way of bringing it out. Uh, this other section, shout out to uh, John Henry uh, Sheck from Growth Plays kind of instilled this one in me is like the beginning state, like thinking about the person before they find this content where are they like what do they know and what do they not know what stands between them and their goal and how do they feel about their predicament so uh, i think this is a really important thing because people like you're marketing and you're producing content for humans who have emotions and social needs and so you want to make sure that you're tapping into that so i understand it and this is how you i think these two things help you um, bring out like the like 
differentiator in content and not just be like an SEO mill or something that was written by uh, AI. Uh, then the end state. So at the end, like what should be absolutely clear to the audience after consuming this content? And it has nothing to do with the product. It has to do with the topic. Um, Cause I've put this in here and had people fill it out uh, before where they say, Oh, they should know about our product. Like put that aside. And this is about uh, what should they, how should they feel after it? Should they feel like that, you know, help me understand how I need to make them feel. And then this last part of what, why would they want to bookmark or share this content? Um, people are obsessed with search and ranking in search and conversion, but in a world where distribution is really, really hard, you want to think about why someone will want to hold on to this piece of content and want to share it with others. When you answer this question, you'll actually be building distribution into it. Uh, then I asked for the thesis. What is the central argument that this content needs to make? Uh, this is like a single sentence that says, like, encapsulates what this piece needs to say through every single word, not at the end or the beginning, but like as a whole, like it just needs to hone in this message. Then there's the obvious like keywords. Uh, I want to understand what keywords are really important here and to make sure that, that they're included. And then what research or resources uh, need to go into this piece and what is it competing against too? Like, don't make me do the work of like going to find other pieces to find out, oh, you pretty much copied someone else or barely scratched the surface of this topic or met the search intent. Um, because I'll then see that, oh, this is actually supposed to be a landing page more so than a blog post. Um, but this is something I need to have in order to shape my feedback. Uh, from there, I love that yeah. that beginning state and end state. By the way, that's very much a like a film and screenwriting principle of like where does where do your characters start and where exactly. do they end up? And if I, nothing happens in between, nothing happens. So exactly because if you think about it, so much B two B SaaS content marketing is a uh, second person. It's like you do this, you will have this outcome. And so what you need to do is that when you think of your, um, your, your audience as a character in a story, like they will be feeling a certain way at the end of this. And you can't, it, when you care deeply about this, it helps you with like the mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive framework of like what needs to be in this content. What is something that I can skip to? So when you know what they already know, you can say, oh, well, why are we putting this what is topic in there because it's like fluff the piece the person might already know what it is they need to know something more um challenging than this and be respected that and understand it um be respected that they have a problem and not be treated like some beginner sometimes um so one of the things that wasn't in here that i added like if you write for me i want the title in the document so i could provide feedback um, I cheated and found the article publish, and this was the title. The title is okay. It's not great. And my request would be to sort of uh, provide like a handful of examples and alternatives. Sorry. Um, and But with this piece, there's bigger fish to fry. Um, and by the way, most of my feedback in this is developmental. I did not have the time to kind of go in and do like nitty gritty uh, line editing because this thing needs to be really reworked. Um, intros so if you go back and watch uh margaret jones's episode please do because she's amazing uh same idea there like i need uh, i need an intro that like acknowledges the audience acknowledges why they've landed there and like guarantees their time won't be wasted remember they only spend 10 to 12 hours a day consuming media none of it is like you know, they don't want to be here. <laughs> they wish they already knew the answer to their problem or had the knowledge or experience so they didn't need your content. So you need to like skip this idea of like a handful of media companies uh, with deep pockets. Like this doesn't do anything. Plus also too, the digital aid started in the 70s. Um, and this whole idea that media was in a handful of companies is like a moot point. Everyone knows that there's TikTokers out there becoming millionaires. Uh, if there's anything that Bill Gates got wrong in his essay of content as king is he says that no business is uh, 
too small to participate. And what he actually should have said is no individual is too small to participate because it's just changed. Um, this part here, it's just a personal pet peeve of mine, but and it's done to appease the algorithms. But repeating the title or an alter, uh, alternative version of it as a secondary heading immediately after the intro, I just just don't like it. Sometimes it's trying to win a featured snippet, and I get it, um, and that's awesome. But it's just a tactic that's always going to might not always win. Like the helpful con uh, content update, like. I think that's going to start to like get this to go away. And, but I think it's, there's an, there's an alternative to this that makes it useful is it's thin content, but if you treated it like a executive summary or a too long, didn't read that provides value and summarizes the content, like I think you would be miles ahead of your competition if you started to do that um, from there. This section and the section below, so it's like the easy parts of starting a media business and a hard part. Like, it's not what I would, this is like the nature of it is what I would expect in the intro. So that's what I meant here is like, it had to be cut down, obviously. You wouldn't want these two paragraphs. Um, but it's just way better at like acknowledging the reader and why they're there. And I think that's what needs to be there. Uh, this also, I want to say is I challenge what this piece says is easy versus hard. Um, I think we need, like I said, need to acknowledge the audience isn't stupid. What are the, you know, there's a sec and then there's a section here that's obviously trying to sell you on a media planning business. And I feel like back to that product led, uh, content idea, you need to earn the right to pitch your product. And this just feels wedged in here. And it's not to say that you can't ever do it. You need to earn it. And so this piece right here, it does not. It's telling you like, oh, the easy part, work with us. Well, you haven't even helped me understand my problem yet. And you also haven't delivered on the promise of the, uh, the piece, which is how to start a media business in six simple steps. I would say too, that there's uh, potentially a very dangerous uh, statement up here. Scroll up just a little bit. So right here, starting a media business, oh, a little Which bit one? further up. <laughs> uh, how far? Uh, the... There we go. So a media business has low barriers to entry, <laughs> right? No, no, it does not. Um, it, it may be in the days where you could get away with, you know, using your phone and, uh, in, 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 or your webcam and just kind of taking it from there, maybe, but to be taken seriously as a media business. Now, take a look at what's going on on YouTube and any of the things that are, you're actually paying attention to. And there's a lot more work that is taken for granted um, with that. Even with this show, we do a lot of editing on the back end to make sure that we're giving only the best stuff. That takes a lot of time. There are, there are a lot of barriers to entry, including knowledge mm -hmm. of actually how to do any of it. So... Um, yeah, I would say that that's, you know, as far as respecting your audience's intelligence, that's cool. And what the subtext of that is, is if you're yeah. even looking at this piece right now, what the hell? Because it's easy. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, they even contradict themselves. It's like, Hey, almost no right way. away. Like, and that's the thing is like it, this is why it feels like it's written for like SEO and not the actual person. Um, so should be the first h2 to follow the introduction someone who's googling something wants to understand something they don't want to go through this long diatribe of what's easy what's hard they just want to get into the actual learning and this is like about the value starts here like think how many like god i've already forgot I, I looked it up at earlier when i was looking at this like how many words and it was like hundreds of words before you get to the value of the piece um for this like that's another thing too, is like, all right, create a plan for your business strategy. Well, I cut all of this content here. It just wastes people's time. Like you're, if it just reads like a Wikipedia article, um, it's like, choose your niche. It, it's not actually giving, it has an opinion. It doesn't exactly help you understand anything. And then when I get down to here, it talks about this example from uh, TechCrunch. And I was like, this is what I would expect in an, um, the intro of a section. Uh, first, obviously, like something 
similar like the a narrative uh on the paragraph above where it talks about how uh there are some guidelines you know get into like the whole idea that like to just end, think about your passions hobbies previous work experience and then you can go into um the story of arrington so it's like saying like what you need to do but the thing is like that needs to be the intro the actual part where it says create a business plan is basically like a throwaway <laughs> like the the most like important part just says like yeah go to the small business administration's website which to me is like okay obviously this audience is only american because if I were trying to um, start a media business in another country, this would be completely relevant to me. Um, but would want more meat here. Like this should be the whole piece here. And I know we were getting almost out of time, uh, but I want to really hone in on this. Step two, sign up for a media planning software. Why? <laughs> why, why is <laughs> signing up for a media software, planning software the second step? Like, Never mind that media businesses typically don't do media planning or buying. Uh, that's the businesses. They sell the media buying and stuff. And But regardless, like they just have so much more to figure out before they get to the step. Like They need something to sell. You can't sell anything if you don't know what it is. And this is why this feels like just like a pill and dog food, but barely even that. Like trying to sell a product because this is the only time we talk about costs yet to start a business like you need to know what the costs are you need to know how much it's going to cost and how much money you're going to make and this is the only place that talks about it anyways um this <laughs> should be a key part of your business plan identifying your target audience i, I at this point i started to feel a little frustrated sorry um this should also be part of the business plan. And then it just ends digital advertising. There's no conclusion. Like overall, this piece needs to circle back. If you want to rewrite this piece, whoever's submitted it and fill this part out. Yeah. When you fill this part out, you will see what I'm seeing about this and you will understand how this piece can do achieve the goal that it needs to achieve and understand what this content needs to say because if i could stop sharing and just look at you to end uh the the thing that this piece needs to do is if the goal of the business is to help sell media and help people buy the software that helps with plan so the goal of this piece is to help someone build a media business it needs to literally spell out every step. There's no simple way to do this. There's no six simple, like probably 500 of them. Now that might be overwhelming, not really something else someone's going to read. So then you need to distill it into multiple pieces, but then have this overarching piece that is like from soup to nuts, like here's everything, but then have a CTA that says, if you want to dive deeper into each of these, like this, but you need to, tr if, if the goal is to have someone buy that software, you need to really help them understand in between what they're building as a media business and then how they'll sell the ads that people will plan and buy. And I would, I would argue too that with that particular piece, the headline signposts to the wrong thing, right? When I'm Googling how to start a media business, I'm not thinking about buying and selling. I'm thinking about, the brand aspect of it, right? Fox has very specific, you mentioned this earlier, Fox has very specific types of shows, right? What's the yep. programming look like? How do you go about hiring your producers and your directors and, you know, what equipment do you yeah. need? And that's what I'm expecting when I see something yeah. like that. Not about the media buying aspect of it, totally different thing. And I don't need a whole how to start a business piece wrapped into this, right? Like, that's right. not what I was looking for. Um, well, cool. We're at time just about here. Can you sort of sum up some of what we've talked about here? And then if anybody's interested in getting a small demo of Content Harmony, then we'll take a look at that. Yeah. So to summarize, my philosophy is to just borrow the best practices of media from the 
media over the last century, maybe or more. Mm. Like Disney's been around for a hundred years. Learn about how Imagineering works and approach things. Like, don't just go and say, "Oh, here's Pixar's storytelling," because it's way deeper than that. Um, understand the medium is the message. Just go Google that, and you'll start to find a bunch of things. And just keep trying. Like, respect your audience. Respect that they have a limited time to spend with you and to make sure you don't waste them because if you just start from there everything else will sort of fall in place fantastic thank you so much for coming on here ronnie uh i'm not seeing in the chat anybody really interested in taking a look at content harmony which is absolutely fine uh thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate your time today man and uh we'll be leaving the show notes and everything else will go out into the replay. Thank you so much, everybody for joining us live and